So we are gonna get started now. Sorry about all the technical difficulties in the way. So our three panelists today, we have Dr. Tracy Lowenthal, a PsyD, who is a clinical community psychologist and owner of Creative Insight Counseling. We have Savannah Leslie, third year PhD student in organizational behavior at Claremont College. And we have Dahlia N. Um, Balsamo, MD. And she's an associate clinical professor of psychiatry of the School of Medicine. So I'm gonna introduce you guys in your slides in order, and then you guys can go ahead and talk about yourself and um, kind of what you, uh, what you do. Okay. So first up, we have Dr. Tracy Lowenthal. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and would you like me to just sort of answer the questions that were sent to me? Is that? Can we just have you introduce yourself right now? <laughs> and um, after the introductions, I'm gonna just ask you guys questions. Okay, awesome, awesome. So um, I am a clinical community psychologist. I have been licensed since 2009. And I, that entire time I've had a private practice in Redlands and in Claremont. I teach online as well in Canada. And I recently received um, certifications to be a, a certified grief educator and also an EMDR provider. All right, thank you so much. Next up, we have Savannah Leslie. Hello. Um, so I got my undergrad in IO psychology and then um, ended up moving up to PhD. It's still technically IO psychology, um, but I call it organizational behavior here. And I specifically study employee well being. So I have a lot of research around employee well being, work life balance, stress, and whatnot. And then um, outside of that, I have four jobs um, just because I like what I do. So one of them is being organizational supervisor of a national crisis hotline I've been a part of for uh, seven years now. And then I also uh, work in a worker well-being research lab at Claremont Graduate University. And then I also uh, work at Southern California Edison in their business technology integration department. So basically what I've been working on lately is a work-life balance initiative that's going to be sent out um, pretty much to everyone. And so we're seeing um, the impact of hi the hybrid work environment and technological communication, how that affects everything. And then my last job is um, I help teach undergrad students at Claremont McKenna and Pomona and all those colleges on campus, um, basically the research process. And um, we get to present at conferences and I get to teach them statistics and programming. So mouthful, but hi, I'm really happy to be here today. Yeah. And we're so thankful that we have you on board. And then next up we have Dahlia and Balsamo. How are you, Eliza? I was on mute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dahlia Balsamo. I'm an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at University of California. Uh, I am also the associate medical director for Tay LGBTQ plus and juvenile justice at the Riverside University Health System. And uh, I am board certified in psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, forensic psychiatry and addiction medicine. I'm actually not from California. I was born in Italy and raised in France, Paris. Uh, and uh, I did my undergrad in University of Virginia where I um, majored in cognitive science and neuroscience and then went on to get my, went on to study for medical school at the University of Pittsburgh. And after that, I did a general psychiatry residency at University of Miami with, uh, and then with two fellowships at Yale, one in child and adolescent psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. Uh, currently I teach med students, residents, fellows, and I also, I'm also involved on um, national and regional levels with different organizations and Advocacy means a lot to me. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you. All right, thank you guys so much. So how this panel is gonna work is I'm gonna go ahead and ask you guys questions. And then if we can just have it um, in order or have you guys answer in order um, from um, Tracy and then Savannah and then Dahlia. 
So, 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 so. Um, our first question is, please tell us a little bit about your work now and your educational background. Okay, so my work now is in private practice. I see probably about 50% of my clients online and 50% in person. And I actually have an office out of my home at this point, which is a super interesting shift. Um, and I got my, I always tell people I took the scenic route. I didn't get my, um, I got an associate's degree at 29 years old and a bachelor's degree at the University of Laverne when I was um, 32. Then I went straight into their doctoral program at Laverne and finished that when I was 37. Um, and then got licensed as a psychologist when I was 39. And I did my my pre-doc and my post-docs um, where Leslie is at the uh, Claremont College's uh, Counseling Center and at the University of Laverne Counseling Center. Okay, um, so for me, I, I kind of already talked about it, my bad, in the introduction, but um, yeah, so I I did my bachelor's at San Diego State um, for their IO psych program. And then I graduated a year early, but then COVID hit. So I ended up having to take a gap year, but it was good because I have a lot of research experiment uh, experience. So I decided to take this time to work with consulting and um, go more the applied route, which was nice because I'm planning on being a consultant and a researcher. Um, so then COVID continued, but it kind of, we got to, be in person a bit more during 2021. So that's when I started my program here. Um, and yeah, so basically just to sum up the jobs that I have, um, what I'm working on right now is looking at worker well-being, but specifically looking at um, technology. So COVID is absolutely a, a terrible thing to happen for me. Um, there's the positive light because it's great for my research, um, but we focus on remote meetings and um, just seeing boundary management. So getting emails or work-related messages on the weekend and seeing how that impacts well-being, stress, rumination, all these different areas. Um, but yeah, I'm very focused on worker well-being and I also have a background in mental health. So um, I also try to weave that in, although IO psychology is typically the, the people who don't have the mental health conditions um but I don't I think that things are changing and I don't necessarily think that's the truth so trying to mix that in there too so in regards to what I do I I do uh several things um I love working with the Tay population the transitional age youth um and uh, I specialize in uh, college mental health. Uh, so I see people age 16 to 25 at my office and I have residents um, from the Riverside University Health System psychiatry residency that come in and also child and some fellows from UCR that rotate there. So I uh, do, um, I precept them and I do supervision there. Uh, and then on, I also uh, do uh, conservatorship evaluations for guardianship through the county of Riverside. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, as the associate medical director for Tay Juvenile Justice and uh, LGBTQ+, I oversee uh, also various clinics uh, that uh, work with the Tay population and also oversee care uh, in the juvenile justice settings. Um, and another thing that I do, I'm the uh, chair of the Medical Staff Wellbeing Committee at RUHS. And uh, basically our committee helps uh, impaired physicians and, uh, and you know, just to help them identify maybe any signs of impairment and then also guide them. Uh, California is one of the very few states that does not have a physician health program. And so a lot of that is actually falls on the organizations and the well-being committees. And because of these various things that I do, like I said, I love doing advocacy. So I'm involved with uh, several organizations that we try to work on a state level and make changes policy wise uh, for the populations that we treat and also for physician health. In terms of my education, I 
gave you some background uh, in the introduction. But uh, for me, learning never stops. So I've actually also gotten some additional trainings after that. So while I was in residency, I did a two-year certificate program in psychodynamic psychotherapy. And then after that, I did a um, nine-month program with Harvard uh, on refugee health. And that was nice because it was in Orvieto. We, we spent two weeks in Orvieto in Italy and, and got to do some sightseeing there. And I recently did a fellowship with UC Davis on physician health. Um, yeah, so it it's always, I feel like I always learn. I, I, I feel like there's always something new to do and, and, and something uh, exciting to like uh, take on. Thank you guys very much for those answers. As you guys can see, there's a lot of different pathways in psychology, whether it's opening your own practice like Tracy, um, going into consulting like Savannah, or uh, going to MD like Dahlia. Um, so my next question for you guys is to please tell us a little bit about your licensure program. So for Tracy, your PsyD, Savannah, your PhD, and then Dahlia, your MD. And what steps did you have to take in order to, to do the work that you're currently doing? Okay. Um, the PsyD program that I went through at Laverne was a five-year program. And as part of that, you did have to complete a dissertation. A lot of PsyD programs don't require that. Um, so that's always something to look at when you're looking at um, graduate work. Um, so the PsyD program required that. Then there's a pre-doctoral internship and a postdoctoral internship, and then the licensing exam. So the EPPP, which is the nationwide exam and then the um, ethics exam for this specific state. Um, so that is what the licensure program or the process looked like. And then, I'm sorry, what was this, the next question? So the other part of that question was just what kind of steps did you have to take to do the work that you're doing now? Um, so I always knew I wanted to be in private practice. So that was always my plan. And I, I joke around when I tell people this, but to open my private practice, I wrote an email to every therapist in my city and I asked them if anybody had an office I could rent. And then I bought a really ugly couch on Craigslist. And that is how I started my practice. So <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that over the years, but it, you know, just to get started, that's, that's what I did. And it worked out pretty well. Um, so for me, it, you know, obviously you have to go through undergrad and everything. Um, I trying to think of the path I took. So for my program, um, I ended up getting my master's in route for our program here. You don't have to do a master's thesis. You just have to take certain classes and they aligned well with mine. So I just tried to finesse my way into getting another degree. Um, so um, but besides that, our program is a little bit different than typical PhD programs. So we have to do what's called a portfolio and our programs five to seven years because of the portfolio. Um, you have to have, I think, eight items. It has to be like a statistics sequence of taking a year's worth of statistics, an evaluation or survey or qualitative tool. Um, you have to have a publication, a presentation field work or um, like as in consulting and whatnot, some type of internship, a teaching certificate, all these different things. And then after, so we take the three years of classes and then we finish our portfolio and then we have to take an oral exam. So rather than written, which I think typically it is for PhD programs, we just basically sit in a classroom or stand. I'm, I'm, I don't know how it's gonna go, but for two to three hours, they're just asking us questions and we have to memorize we have to cite what we say. We don't get any piece of paper. So that'll be fun to do next fall. Um, and then, yeah, then we do the dissertation, dissertation defense, and then have the degree. So I should have it in a couple of years, I think, or 2025. I think I'm doing a little bit early. Um, I've been planning on getting my PhD in psychology since I was 13. So I've been very diligently on this path. Um, and uh, so with that, I've I feel like, let's see, steps in order to do the work I'm currently doing. I honestly credit, and I say this a lot to people um, in undergrad or people just trying to pursue anything, 
it really is about connections. So for me, I really networked. I always went up to a professor after class, talked to them, went to their office hours. That's how I got my first publication, my research lab experience in undergrad. So I basically just make connections. They tell me, oh, this job would be really good for you, or uh, maybe I think this field is good for you. Let's talk about it and whatnot. And um, that's where I've gotten the jobs pretty much um, is just making those connections and reaching out and not being afraid of rejection because um, that's just part of it. And so, yeah, I, I really credit it to networking and, and that's just allowed me over time that snowball effect of having that networking, building up experience in research, building up experience in consulting. Um, so yeah, that that's pretty much how I got to where I'm currently at. So in regards to how um, I got here and the licensing process, so, and uh, the licensing process can be, requires several steps. So first, you know, um, I, I had to do four years of undergrad because that's the minimum that you have to do before going into med school. And, um, and also for, for the different steps of my training, because I just love to travel and I like to experience living in different places. I, I made a point of doing it in different parts of the country so I can get some experience there. Uh, but uh, basically, in order to get your license uh, in medicine, you have what we call the USMLE. So and there are three steps to that one, two and three. Uh, and um, usually you take the step one in your second year. Uh, before what we call the clinical years, which are usually in your third and fourth year. And uh, step two is usually taken in your fourth year. And then step three is usually taken in your intern year. Step one tends to be the one that a lot of uh, med students stress about because it also determines uh, which residency you're going to match. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the matching system, so basically uh, in your fourth year, as you are going to apply to different residencies and you decide what specialty you want to do, you uh, put in your application and then you apply to a bunch of programs and then you may interview and then the programs do the same thing. And then on uh, on one day, like, you know, you, you rank your programs, they rank you and it's an algorithm. And so we have something called match day, which is in March. And it can be quite nerve wracking because first thing is like, you, you want to know if you matched, right. And then the second one is like, where you matched. And, um, yeah, I mean, for me, I don't like surprises. So I remember match day, I think I may have, to be honest, I, you know, I, confession here I think I even skipped match day <laughs> I, I like went to a spa or something that day. I was like I cannot I cannot deal with the pressure um but but most most people who are not as anxious as me you know they it can be quite ce ce celebratory because you're there with your classmates and you open an envelope and then you find out where you matched um and then after you finish whatever I mean you know um so in my case I wanted to do psychiatry and why psychiatry? Because in med school, I realized I just love talking to the patients. Like I was not as interested about lab results or anything like that. For me, it was really their story that that was interesting to me. And so I, I knew very early on that that's what I wanted to specialize in. Um, so after like you do psychiatry, um, usually if you want to do child and adolescent psychiatry, you can do it can apply in your third year. I applied in my fourth year because I was doing extra training in psychodynamic psychotherapy and, and I wasn't so sure if I really wanted to do child and adolescent. But but then you you do a fellowship in that. I mean, well, I did a fellowship in that for two years. And then after that, I did another fellowship for forensics. And so after you do these fellowships and you finish your residency, then you become what we call board eligible. And so that is something that is extra, but usually if you want to have a job or, you know, you want to have creds, you, uh, you, it does help to have a board certification. Um, so that was the reason why, like, I, I got board certifications in all these specialties. And then, and then during COVID, I, I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> like, 
I have nothing to do right now. What am I going to do? I, I, and then I actually studied for the uh, addiction medicine board exam. It's like one of the few board exams you don't have to do a fellowship right now. So so that's how I got like my additional um, board there. And how I got to this job, um, well, Southern California was one of the places that I had not tried. And I knew that I like sunny places. And my best friend from fellowship told me about this position. And that's actually how I applied. And I mean, I applied to other places, but I really liked it. And and, I, and I'm glad that I did. I've been here for about seven years. All right, thank you guys so much for those answers. Um, as you guys heard from them, um, the many different pathways come with like different ups and lows, whether it's starting from scratch, getting a couch off Craigslist and opening your own practice or getting like millions of certifications during your PhD program, or even just the stress of match day. There's a lot of different things you have to prepare for. And that's just something you can think about as you think about going into these different pathways. So my next question for you guys, is what is something that you really enjoy or you find rewarding about your field of study? Um, I really, really loved um, the doctoral program at the University of Laverne was when I was in it, it was a clinical community psychology program. Now, unfortunately, it is just a clinical program, but the community piece is so important to me because it really infuses the program with um, diversity and equity and inclusion training and that's really, really important. Um, and I work predominantly with the LGBTQ community. And so I just really, really love that work and being able to support my clients in multiple ways. Um, so I hate public speaking. So, and I, I cannot emphasize that enough. <laughs> so that is like, there's a lot of, I'd rather go to the dentist than do public speaking, honestly. But just the way that the world is working right now, it requires mental health professionals to be advocates. You have to go out. Not, I shouldn't say that you, you don't have to, but I think it's sometimes it's a really important thing to go and advocate for people in other venues other than just your office. So lately I've been speaking at school board meetings about the oppressive things that are happening in school boards and going to city council and advocating for you know, flying a pride flag during pride month and, and really getting out in the world and, and seeing the things that affect our clients and trying to create change around those things to create more safety and, and security for our clients. Um, and I just have to say that being a therapist is literally the best job in the world because I get to hear about people's struggles and also help them figure out what to do in the face of those struggles. And I wish people didn't have to be so resilient, but it is awe inspiring to see the kind of resilience that I get to see every day. It's truly like, I always walk out of my little office to my house and just think, my God, I am really the luckiest person to be able to sit and hear these stories and, and to get to know these people and that they trust me with the, the hardest parts of their lives. And then unfortunately, Savannah had to go. So we're just gonna move on to you, Dahlia. Yes, yeah, so uh, for me, it is very uh, similar to what Dr. Lowenthal was saying. Um, I uh, I really like the advocacy part of it. Um, and uh, one of the things that actually uh, we did and, and, and I helped uh, start was uh, at the at, at RUHS, we started a trans health center. And um, that to me was a big um, accomplishment because it was really hard for our trans community in the Indian Empire to get like the care that they needed. And they and they had to go, you know, to like either Orange County or like LA County. And and uh, there was a lot of like travel involved. And uh, so we were able to like make uh, that happen. And also on a more like advocacy level, um, I am part of the Children and Law Committee at uh, ACAP. I'm, uh, ACAP stands for the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And so one of the things that um, I I did this actually as a fellow, um, I started the draft for a policy 
uh, to help uh, trans youth in the juvenile justice system. And we recently uh, updated the policy to reflect, uh, you know, the more modern and current language. The other thing that I also find super rewarding is uh, whenever I see a young person come to my office and at the beginning, you know, they may they may not feel so great about the future or about themselves. And then over time, seeing their growth and like seeing them feeling more empowered and, and, and get better. Um, and, you know, just like seeing that, that change and like seeing them grow and uh, into the person that they were always meant to be, to me, it means a lot. And, and a lot of times, you know, when they quote unquote graduate from my clinic, usually when you hit 25, 26, you're graduating. I, 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 I like to like sit down and like reflect with them, like all of the great things that they've done during this time. Um, and the other thing that I also love about my job is, is the training, like training our next generation of doctors. And uh, they keep me on my toes. <laughs> like, you know, like they always like ask me about the new literature and all that. And I love it. And, and, and it keeps me up to date, but also it really helps me like, see you know and like uh, help shape you know what the the future of um medicine and like how psychiatry is practiced so it seems that a common theme between our panelists is that they are very well well versed in advocacy and they find it really rewarding so that is something that can definitely occur if you keep going into that road so my next question for you guys is what is something that you find challenging about your field of study? Uh, gosh, that's there's a lot of really challenging things about this job, I would say, but probably for me, the most challenging is finding ways to serve people that cannot afford services is one. Um, and another is hearing about the, the really terrible things that people experience that, that can be really challenging. Before I decided to go to graduate school, I thought I got to figure, I got to find out if I can hack this, right? Can I do this or not? So I volunteered um, with the Riverside County Rape Crisis Center. And then I did um, support groups for family members who whose loved ones had cancer. I figured if I could handle, handle sexual assault and cancer, I could probably do just about anything. So I think if you're looking at clinical work, finding a way to volunteer and experience some of that is, is a really good thing. Um, but yeah, just trying to be creative and, and get people the help that they need, even if you're not the one that's able to provide it. I think that can be a really challenging thing. I, I always say I'm a, a PsyD, but all of my supervisors were social workers. So if somebody needs a resource, I'm going to figure out how to get them that resource or how to connect them with someone that will. And, um, Dr. Leslie said earlier that, um, I'm not sure if she's Dr. Leslie yet, but, uh, soon to be, um, but relationships matter and it's the connections you make with others. So you can call a colleague from school or a friend or an old professor and say, hey, do you know about where I can get this information? So there's, it's not just the face-to-face one-on-one in private practice, that's most of it, but also there's a lot of other ways that you can help people. And that's challenging is how do I, how do I balance my life in a way that I can do those things and also stay sane and healthy myself, you know? So what I do, I have noticed, at least for me, I think like every one that, uh, you know, they tend to find, you know, they have their growth zones. <laughs> for me, it's always been uh, cases that involve abuse. So it's either uh, a case involving um, child abuse or dependent adult abuse and and then how do you navigate that and of course like you're a mandatory reporter and but then again like how do you ensure that the person that you're treating is gonna be at a safe place or not and you know and what are the implications of the reporting so that has always been more difficult for me it's really like mostly like the the ethical dilemmas that we sometimes have to face another one is you know respecting our patient's autonomy like you know to uh refuse for example like addiction treatment that they really need to have 
but then at the same time, like we know that that would be to their benefit, but at the same time, I mean, there are, they still have the right to, to decline. And so like, you have to work with them. I'm lucky enough that I work with a team. I mean, I, I, I have, uh, we have a therapist on our team. We have peer uh, support on our team and then behavioral health specialist and, and I really feel like I would not be able to do the work that I do if it wasn't for my team. So I'm actually very grateful for that. Thank you guys so much for answering those questions. So as you guys can see from our panelists, you have to deal with a lot of heavy topics. So that is something you need to mentally prepare yourself if you are willing to go into that field. And like they said, it is good to start early. If you can do like volunteering of some sort to help with that, that is a great pathway. It's a great way to start your pathway into these fields. Okay, so off of those questions, I wanna ask, what is a day in your life like? Hmm. Um, a day in my life is usually, uh, <laughs> I try to get up and exercise every day. I think really focusing on taking care of yourself is a very important part of this job. Um, because if you're not at your best, you're not going to serve your clients as well as you could. Um, I try to see no more than six people in a day. Uh, my sweet spot is five people. Um, and I also think about what does that person, what are they going to be presenting me with today? So if I have really, really heavy trauma clients, I'm not going to book two or three of those together. I'm going to do one and then maybe do a, a client who's maybe just working on communication or, or something a little bit lighter. Um, so like today, I think I saw five people and, you know, I'll see three, I'll take a break, have some lunch, do something. Then I did a consultation um, because I had I was lacking some expertise with one of my clients. So I did a consultation about that work. And then I saw the remaining clients and then I'm doing this. So, you know, it's, and, and through, through the years, I've figured out like what works really well for me. And, and like a lot of people, I tend to find a, a really strong balance. Then I get rested and then I say yes too often and sort of rinse repeat. So I think, knowing yourself and knowing your boundaries can be really, really important too in setting up your, your day as much as possible. And luckily I'm, I'm able to design my own day because I'm in private practice, but you know, trying to be really aware of your own limitations as a human so that you can do the work that you need to do. So my days vary. Uh, I, I work Monday through Thursday. Um, that's another reason why I like this job. I love my three-day weekends. <laughs> and uh, on Mondays and Tuesdays are similar in the sense that in the mornings, I I see my own patients. And then in the afternoons, that's when I get the trainees uh, that come in. And then I supervise them seeing the patients at the clinic. And then on Wednesdays, uh, they tend to be my more flexible days, but also my busiest because those are the days that I do the work for my conservatorship evaluations and the physician well-being committee. And, and I also give a lot of lectures on those days uh, as well. And on Thursdays in the morning, I usually see my patients. I also meet with the team and we discuss cases. And in the afternoon is also when I kind of like wrap up whatever is like left from like admin work. Um, and, and, and that could be a range of like uh, different things. Also during interview season, when we interview for applicants, I help out with that as well. So sometimes, you know, I, I could be, you know, interviewing like a morning or an, an afternoon and doing that kind of stuff. But yeah, so that's how like my days are. Thank, thank you very much for those answers. So as you can see, the work the work life balance varies from um, person to person. Uh, Tracy um, adjusted so she doesn't have to deal with like consistently like high trauma people to maintain to make sure her mental health is okay. And Dahlia obviously has a very a different work life balance. She works Monday through Thursday, three day weekend. Great. So it's great to hear that you guys have that kind of balance in your life. Um, my next question for you guys is. If you could start over, would you do anything differently or would you pursue a different career by any chance? I, gosh, that's a great question. I don't know that I would do everything, anything differently. I, 
I got really lucky with the uh, couch on Craigslist and the the meeting or the office that I rented. Um, this was actually my second career. I was a legal secretary for 15 years before I decided to get into this. And um, yeah, no, I'm, I I love this job and I've been really lucky in the, in the decisions I made early on have, have really worked out well. Um, so no, I think I would, I would do things. I would probably buy a better couch um, than the, I had a red velour couch, which is pretty horrific. If you think about that. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I think actually I would have probably gotten my EMDR certification earlier because that's a pretty cool modality. And I wish I had had access to it earlier. I think what I would have done differently, I I wasn't as adventurous for some reasons when I was younger. Uh, now, you know, I, I travel to a lot of different countries and I love it and I've done a lot of solo travel. But for some reasons, when I was in medical school, I just wasn't that adventurous. I don't know why. I mean, I had traveled to other countries, but but, you know, there were some opportunities like one of them was like, you know, uh, get doing a rotation in the Amazon jungle. And now I look back and I really regret not having, you know, done that or applied for it. And, and there was also another opportunity to work with uh, the Navajo. And, and now I'm like, oh, I really wish that I had done it. But for some reasons, like, when I was in med school, I think I think it was a, the anxiety thing, you know, like, I, I like picked up yoga, uh, I actually am a certified instructor now. But, but I, but I picked up yoga and meditation a little bit later on, um, I would say maybe my like third, third year of med school. And that helped me <laughs> deal with a lot of like, the anxiety that I, I dealt with when I was like younger. Um, so maybe that would be another thing I would do differently, I would have picked up the yoga and the meditation, like, early on um, so that I wouldn't have been as neurotic and anxious when I was in med school and and like worrying about what the next step is going to be and like kind of like explore a little bit more. Thank you for those answers. So as you guys heard, um, you should be more adventurous and I think you guys are all taking the good first step in coming to this meeting and also buy a couch off Craigslist according to Tracy. <laughs> Um, my next question for you guys is going to be, um, do you have any advice for undergraduates in particular who may want to pursue a similar line of work as you? I would absolutely say like um, Savannah had said earlier, start connecting with the people that are doing what you want to do. So you know, for instance, if if being in private practice is something that you're interested in, start joining the, I know probably people your age are not doing Facebook as much, but um, Facebook groups or Instagram or TikTok, like follow all those private practice pages, um, start making connections with people, reach out to them for and ask them questions. Um, it is the relationships that will really help you. And so I would definitely do that. Um, and I always tell my students when I'm teaching that if you want to be a therapist, I highly, highly recommend that you are also in therapy because it is really important to know what it is like on the other side of the room and to know what that vulnerability is like before you jump into asking people to be that way with you. It's good to understand what it, what it is like. And, and also, I just think therapy is just the most beneficial thing ever. And especially if you're going into mental health, you need a therapist because you're going to hear things that you cannot unhear and you cannot, you don't want to share them with your, obviously confidentiality is a thing, but you can't even go to a friend and be like, Hey, I heard this horrible thing today because you start to be aware that you're going to plant that in someone else's mind and they're not going to be able to get rid of it either. So having another person that, in a professional setting that can you can process everything that you're hearing with, I think is a really, really important thing. I have to second that. Uh, definitely networking is very important, volunteering, um, mentorship. And, uh, and I have to second like being in, in therapy. Uh, luckily enough, in my residency, they offered us 
low fee um, psychotherapy and I actually ended up doing my own psychoanalysis. So you go about four times a week and, you know, it, it was quite interesting, but, um, and, and, and I'm glad because it is true. You, you do learn uh, to know yourself better. And then you also learn techniques too. Cause I was like, Oh, that was interesting the way he did that, you know? <laughs> And uh, yeah, so uh, do not be shy. Definitely, like if you if you see someone who is doing what you like, definitely reach out to them. I think like that's a very good um, step to to start. Also, um, you know, like these organizations like ACAP, the APA, the American Psychiatric Associations, and and the AMA. I I, I believe that they do offer. I know at least for medical students, they have free memberships. I'm I don't know if they have them uh, also for for undergraduates, but it may be worth a try to look at their websites um, because then this way you can also start the networking early. All right, thank you. And as you guys could hear, um, one very reoccurring theme is to keep networking, networking, networking. And with that in mind, I was wondering if you guys, if you're comfortable, are willing to share like your email address or any contact, contact information in the chat for our um, students to contact you. And with the last 10 minutes, I wanted to ask if the audience has any questions for the panel. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, <laughs> um, I guess it's just in general, um, when they were at undergrad, was there like any mentee or mentor that they specifically talked to that helped guide them to go into higher education? Or is it something that they always like plan for themselves and they like take that path that to Okay, so the question was that in your undergrad, was there any like mentor or anything that you guys had? Or was it just something that you guys kind of knew and knew that you wanted to do that from like the get go? Um, for me, it was absolutely a professor, um, and I don't know if uh, Abby is still in this meeting or not, but um, a professor, uh, Dr. Pelletieri, was my Psych 101 professor in undergrad, and I asked him all along the way what he thought of things I was thinking of, like, and I was trying to decide between getting a, a master's degree and a doctoral degree, he's the person I called and just said, you know, what do you think of this? And you know me as a student, what do you think I can handle? And so I, I do think reaching out to people that you respect or, or professors um, and other professionals you encounter and just start building those relationships so you can ask them for their guidance and, and hopefully they'll, they'll be willing to offer that to you. Cause I, I think it's good to get lots of different opinions about the things that you would like to do and then settle in on your own. So for me, my interest actually started very early on when I was a teenager. Uh, my mom, uh, she started interior design at UCLA, but but she had an interest in uh, psychology and psychoanalytic theory. And then I would just look at her bookshelf and and then you know this is kind of like how I got to know about Carl Jung and 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 Freud. And and I had a I have to say I had a uh, what do you call it like more of an idealistic you know kind of a dreamy way of like how how things are and, and that stuff always fascinated me um in undergrad oddly enough that I can think about it um most of the people that I associated with were actually more becoming future lawyers <laughs> like you know I I was part of the Jefferson Literary Debating Society um and not so much with, with people who were uh, in med school. However, I had friends who were in med school. And, and for me, I, I had already decided. Um, I always kept going back and forth between uh, going to med school and become a psychiatrist or like studying psychology. And eventually I, I, I decided, you know, going into med school and then studying um, psychiatry. Uh, but I had mentors later on that I really looked up to uh, in my field. It's just like in undergrad, I I was very much someone who just had an interest in almost a lot of different things. And, and maybe because part of me knew that I was gonna go into um, psychiatry, I, I kind of more, yeah, spent time with like people who were like 
philosophers, <laughs> lawyers, and I did found though the Cognitive Science Society. So, so, so that was something that was like psychology related. Uh, I was a founder and the president of the Cognitive Society, uh, Cognitive Science Society for like um, uh, two years. And then, uh, and I did major in neuroscience and cognitive science. Thank you very much for those answers. And then one final question before we let you guys go. Um, how would you define the value of peer mentorship? And, it have, and do you have any advice for students serving as current mentors? You know, um, I think for me personally, peer mentorship was really important in graduate school, not, ne not as important in undergrad. Um, because I think the peer mentorship piece in grad school, we were all sort of looking at different lines of work. And so we could sort of run past each other in that regard and, and come up with ideas and stuff. But that is a really big part of my life now, like being able to reach out to colleagues and get guidance and, and provide it to them as well. So going back to that network thing, I, I think that um, peer mentorship can be really important. And I think if you are serving as a peer mentor with other students, really having solid boundaries about what that looks like. You know, if you hear, I think in the question in the chat, you know, if 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 you're caring too much for your mentee, that's gonna affect your mental health. And so having a really clear uh, set of boundaries around that. And, and also I think not jumping in and taking on too much for your mentee and, and, and honoring yourself in that process as well, I think would be really important. So that question actually reminded me of something that I had completely forgotten because not to age myself, I was an undergrad a long time ago. So, and then I remembered I was a peer mentor um, as an undergrad. I mean, hopefully it was helpful. I mean, you know, like, I mean, that people meet with me. Um, I, I like, like I said, like for me, seeing my friends, you know, doing different things was very inspiring to me. And also like the people around me, I, I do believe like peer mentorship can be quite helpful. And like Dr. Lowenthal was saying, I felt like as, as I progressed in my career, it became more and more crucial. Like peer mentorship really meant something to me once I started my psychiatry residency. Um, and that's when, you know, when I was a first year resident, uh, I had a third year resident, like, you know, taking me under his wing. I mean, not, not only him, but then there were others, you know, but, and, and that was really helpful because he, he, he would guide me what to expect on rotations and what to do and like what's out there. Uh, so I, I am definitely a proponent of that. And even now, even now as a, as a colleague, like, you know, we have, we have colleagues that we reach out to and we have to discuss, like, you know, those like difficult cases that we encounter and, 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 and sometimes like the field can feel very isolating. Right. So even for like, you know, from a mental and like, well, from a well being perspective, it, it is important to have, uh, that peer support. Thank you very much. So as I talked about, the peer support is very important in many aspects. And um, with that, it is 726. So in respect to your time, we're going to close this panel. I wanted to thank you guys very much for all of your insight, answers to our questions. I'm really sorry about the technical difficulties in the beginning, but we really do appreciate you being here. All right, thank you so much.
Okay, and then just to do our final announcements because we wanted to have the time for the panelists, our directors of events and outreach um, application is still open. Um, it's open until Wednesday, November 1st at 11.59 p.m. Please apply. I'm tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we also have our psychology winter camp director open. Um, Ulysses isn't here to talk about it, but it's basically a virtual outreach program hosted by Psychi for high school students. We put on this little virtual um, virtual camp for the high schoolers, and then they kind of get involved and learn about the field of psychology, and we kind of invite them to pursue higher education. As well, inductions committee, Alexa. <laughs> if you're interested in um, setting up our inductions for the fall quarter, you can go ahead and um, scan this QR code. You can either help with the logistics, which is like all the money, what events we're gonna host, um, music or the design, which is like social media posts and stuff like that. Yeah. No, you can be a prospective member as well. And then I'm just gonna take we, we might stop David. <laughs> and then constitution voting for all of our official members here, you can go ahead and do the updated draft on the new constitution. We're going to um, upload these and you can click on the link and it will give you the, it will send you there. And this is going to be closing on Monday, October 30th. And then on Friday, we have a Halloween movie night. Um, come join us. We're going to have popcorn and drinks, and we're going to pick between three scary movies to watch. And then some more upcoming events. We have the Share Circle, November 1st at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be a Hub 260, so right here, cards for seniors. Um, we're going to be making cards for seniors, and you're going to get volunteer hours for that. That's going to happen um, November 3rd at 3 p.m., and our next general meeting, which is gonna be in this room again, same time in two weeks. And this is all of our links. If you're not on our mailing list, Discord or website or anything. Okay. Thank you guys for coming to the general meeting. And our social is gonna start now. Um, Abby should be on her way with the boba as soon as it's all ready for anyone that ordered. And I got slime.